All righty. Hello, everyone. How are we doing this time of living? We're going to be sounding a little bit different today because I'm wearing my space outfit for our planetarium show today, and it's really hard to try and clip my normal microphone to me. So we got the headset going on today. So apologies on the lower quality, but it's easier for me. So I'm doing that <laughs> instead of having this thing that's like clunked over to the side, a little bit messed up. So today... We're going to be trying out our first of hopefully a relatively successful skit is the wrong word, but we're amusing of Sundays being a planetarium show of sorts. I have a little bit of an idea of what kind of things I want to go through today, but at any point, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them out at me at any time. You won't jack up my flow by asking me a question. I'll be more than happy to answer anything along the way. And so you might be like, what do you mean a planetarium show? How we, like, I'm at home, and you're at your home, obviously. Like, how are you doing a planetarium show? Well, that is all thanks to a program called Stellarium, which basically is this really great open-sourced planetarium software, space software, whatever you prefer to call it, in which you can be in any town that you wish. In this case, it's going to be Denver, but it kind of gives you a very generic kind of layout as far as the... Hang on, I'll come back. There we go. As far as there's grass around, just to give you a general idea of where the ground is, it keeps the cardinal points, including south, southeast, north, all that jazz. And you have the sky above you at whatever time you could want, whether it be now, into the past. You can make go back in time if you want. Just click a few times. There goes the bye bye sun. Or you can have it go into the future. You can skip over a little bit and be like, hey, I want the sun back. Bring it back. So obviously, if you couldn't tell, a little bit of a motion thing to keep in mind. So if you're a little motion sick, I'm going to go as slow as I can, but it might still be a little sensitive to you. So if that ever happens, just look away from the screen for a second, take some deep breaths, look down, look at something solid that ain't moving, and you'll be fine in just a few moments. So in any case, let's just go ahead and begin then. So I got it at yesterday, essentially, but a time of day. Uh, about seven in the morning and I'm going to let it go a little bit faster. So we're not just staring at the sun move in real time. Cause that's too slow, too boring. And one thing I want to show and talk about here is the sky. I mean, that seems simple enough and easy, but maybe not. Maybe you don't quite know what's going on when I mean that the sky is blue. I mean, you, you know that the sky is blue, I hope, but maybe you don't quite know why. Some have said that the sky is blue because of the oceans slash any body of water. Some say well, the water is blue because of the sky, but those things are actually totally independent of each other. So bodies of water are just naturally blue, just as water's natural tint. If you get enough of it, you start to actually see that blue coloring. That's why even indoor pools are still blue. You could have them totally shut off from the outside world and the sky, and they'll still be blue. The sky, the reason why it is blue is because our sun is giving off a full spectrum of light, essentially, given all the colors, not in equal amounts, of Roy G. Biff, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But when it reaches our atmosphere, our air likes to scatter around the blue light. So to help show a little bit better idea of what I mean by that, is I got my little handy dandy big boy dry erase board here. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say we have our sun right here in the corner. What's up, Mr. Sun? How you doing? He's going to have some sunglasses. Why wouldn't he? He's bright. He knows that he wants to protect his eyes, but he's got sunglasses on. That's good. All right. And let's say we are just down here on the ground. Just got some nice grass. And I'm just going to put in these circles to represent atoms in our air. Very much zoomed in, obviously, because atoms are a lot smaller than that. But just so that you can see. For the most part, there is nitrogen in our air, about 70% worth of nitrogen. Then you're in the 20s area before you actually have oxygen, and then you have all kinds of extra crap after that. We don't care about so much. Why am I talking about the nitrogen that's there? Well, nitrogen doesn't do all too much for our breathing besides just being there. It's just for the sake of air pressure, really, in a sense, the oxygen we breathe. But nitrogen is important as far as our atmosphere color. 
So our sun's giving off the entire spectrum, right? So we're getting some reds. I make it all the way through. We're doing just fine. I don't have every color, but we got a general idea. We got some oranges. Orange, no problem. It goes right through. Not much happening. Atmosphere don't really care about it. Even green. Green, you know what? Blam. Goes right through. Who cares? Now, the interesting part, of course, is when the blue comes into play. Which I need to stop my planetarium show. It's going ahead of me. <laughs> so what happens with blue and why we're able to see our sky as being such that color is that the blue that comes out from the sun hits any any one of these nitrogen atoms, really. It doesn't matter. And gets diffracted around, gets bounced around from one to another. It goes in different directions and gets scattered throughout the sky. This blue here might come here and go over there and then go over there and then go over here and come over here and then go over there. And that blue sky, so if you imagine that, make a little room for a buddy. Hey, buddy. Where's buddy? You like buddy? Buddy is sitting here seeing all these different colors coming in just fine. So he's getting a relatively white scaling. That's why the sun looks semi-white, but more on why it's yellowish and stuff in a second. But all of this blue light is getting scattered around and coming at him at different angles. So you can imagine that what if there was an atom right here that some blue light would have bounced into his eye from over here. Some blue light from this atom would be bouncing off over here. And from here, and from here, and from here. So although the sun is giving off its light in one particular spot, like when you look in the daytime sky, how you see the sun in just one general spot that you're not supposed to look at. <laughs> Be safe, don't look at it. When you look up into the sky, you're getting bombarded by all of these different areas of blue light that have been scattered from the atmosphere. Sun comes in, light comes in from one spot, bounces all over the place, and you see it coming at you from all different angles. So the whole entire sky looks blue. Thanks, buddy. Oh, I'm glad we're still here talking about the sun being yellow. So you can imagine. <laughs> one moment. My dry erase works pretty good. So we'll keep our sun there. We'll still need him. And let's say we got our full spectrum of light coming out again. So we got the red. We got the orange. You got the yellow. Got the blue. And you get the indigo violet purple thing, whatever. So you can imagine that if we had our atmospheric bubble, that's what this line's gonna be, it's our boundary line, and our sun is giving off all the colors of the spectrum, which when those combine together in our eye, we see them as white. Hence, our sun appears white, but another day on why it actually isn't a white star. Kind of fun to talk about that, but for another day. <clears throat> so if we need all of these different colors in order for us to see white, we need all from Roy down to Biv. You can imagine that our atmosphere lets the red through, right? Nothing happened before in the previous drawing that we had. The red just went right through, right to, the, right to Bobby on the ground. Didn't matter. Orange, same thing. Goes right through. The nitrogen doesn't do anything with that. Green, same thing. Nothing happens. It goes through. But it's the blue that gets left out. Comes right to here and bounces all over the, all over the place. But doesn't go through as easily. Purple, same thing, but not as important. Now, if I tell you, because it's true, that our sun gives off the majority of its light in the color spectrum, at least, more so in the green area, green to yellow orange area. You can imagine this showing like an amount. Got all these fun angles going here. <laughs> so you have the amount that is emitted. Ceiling shot? Yeah, but it's tiny. <laughs> Very good. The amount emitted. Oops, let's get rid of that. Sun gives off little less purple, a little less red, a good deal of the orange greens, and a tiny bit of the blues. So if you need all those colors for white and you get rid of its blue because of our atmosphere, 
And then you're left with all kinds of warm toned colors, including red, orange, and yellow. So that is why when you're looking from Earth to our sun, if you want to risk it, or if you are safe and you have some kind of blocking mechanism to bring down the brightness of the sun so you don't hurt your eyes, you'll notice that the sun is a yellow tint. That's because it is a white star, white for now, white star giving off all colors of the rainbow, but our atmosphere gets rid of the blue, which is a cooler tone, leaving you just the warmer tones, giving you an overall yellow type star. So that's that boy. Thanks for your drawings. Come back to that. Some other thing will probably grab our attention and we'll have to talk about it. <laughs> okay. So here we are. As we let time go by a little bit, we are now in the evening. This would be six o'clock in the evening, local time to now Denver, which is fine. And we can see over there in the corner where the sun had just set, which I'll prove to you just by backing up a little bit so you can see kind of where it is. There's our sun. Seems good. Let future go. Let time go into the future again. And we're going to let things stop a little bit right here. Now, just to really talk about for a second again, because we kind of went through a lot of the drawings, is what happens exactly with the sunset? Why are they so much warmer toned than the rest of the sky ever is? Well, actually, that's probably easier to just draw again anyway. So <laughs> come back, drawing. We missed you. Okay. We love him. Okay. I get real zoomed in on there, buddy. <laughs> okay. So you can imagine that we have Mr. Sun, Mrs. Sun, non di binary, non binary Sun. Doesn't matter. Whatever the Sun wants to be, all the same. Okay. Sun is here, Earth is here. Biggie. Hey, quit zooming in so much. Back up. <laughs> Big E. And around it, we have our atmosphere. Now, Mr. Sun is going to start here. And we have Bobby right here. There's Bobby. There's our viewer, the one that's going to be looking over in the sunset and being like, oh, look at the pretty colors. So during the day, when Bobby is here, the sunlight is coming straight down. At high noon, the sun is going right on the top of his head. So he's getting a little bit of that whole blue diffraction thing that we saw before, where the nitrogen is taking the blue light and bouncing all over the place. He's getting a little bit of it, enough to where he gets a nice blue sky and a yellow toned star. That's about it. That's kind of on the low end. Now, as time goes on and the sun does not revolve around the Earth, Keep that in mind when I go and redraw this. It is not that the sun is actually moving. It's simply that I put the sun in a bad spot. I should have had him just have the earth rotate. Oh, here's the sun again. There's the sun. And some time has gone by. And Bobby is now in the evening. It's nighttime now. He's ready. He's ready for that sunset. He's like, man, I've been waiting all day for that. I'm so excited. So now the light is still coming from the same spot, pretty much. Like within 12 hours, a few hours, the sun slash the earth haven't moved all that much to where we can say the sun is pretty much at the same spot. Light's coming down. And if it was noon over in this part of the world, they're getting the same thing that Bobby had. A little bit of the diffraction, blue sky, yellow sun. That's it. I think it's going to drive me nuts. I'm going to try and turn off this auto zoom. One moment. There. See if that helps. Still doing it? Well, glad we have that feature to turn it off and you know it doesn't do anything. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the person here that's experiencing high noon gets a little bit of the blue light diffracting, gets a blue sky, yellow sun. Light comes down here to Bobby and goes through a considerable amount more atmosphere before it gets to Bobby's eyes. So here is how much atmosphere goes through to the viewer that is at noon. An okay amount, really. For Bobby, 
being on the side, that light has to go through much more atmosphere. You can notice that the red for Bobby is much bigger than the orange for the noon person. Cindy. Cares. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean anything? Of course it does. So if it is our atmosphere that is playing with the blue light, that's bouncing it around, getting rid of the blue light in a sense to make our sun appear more warm toned or yellow, then having more atmosphere means we're going to have more of that effect resulting in more warm tones and getting rid of the blue. You might be thinking, but shouldn't I have a bluer sky because it's bouncing all over the place? It's bouncing all over the place as that light enters. So it starts off being quite blue right over here. So if someone was viewing the sunlight from here, they'd be seeing a nice blue sky. It'd be like two in the afternoon, nice and blue. But as that blue light becomes weaker and weaker, because it's getting bounced around early on, there's less of it to make it all the way to Bobby. So yes, this atmosphere is still bouncing around any blue light that's left, but there's really not a lot left. So all you get is a bunch of the reds, orange, and purples that are bouncing around in the clouds and such that are nearby, if any, for your sunset. You get a nice, beautiful view. Nature's beautiful. My drawing's a little less. <laughs> we're working out. We're practicing. <laughs> it's just my first day, okay? All right. Go back to that. I don't need to clean that just yet. Okay. Now back to back to our regular scheduled programming. Okay, so here we are back at the sunset. When the sun does finally go all the way gone, I hate that. Does that? <laughs> then we'll finally be able to see the nighttime sky because with the sun gone, we no longer have that source of color for our atmosphere to bounce around and make it to where we cannot see the nighttime sky. To show you that. To back up a little bit again, just enough to bring up the sun a tiny bit. Good. I'm going to turn off the atmosphere. Just pay attention to where the sun is and how it looks and how the whole nighttime sky looks. Atmosphere gone. Atmosphere on. Atmosphere not on. Off. <laughs> so if you ever wanted to know what it's like to be on any body, whether it be a planet, moon, otherwise that does not have any kind of atmosphere, it would simply look like this. Like it wouldn't matter that the sun is up or down. You would just see this really bright object in the sky. The sun would just move around anyway. Because if we don't have the atmosphere, we don't have the nitrogen in our example. And if we don't have nitrogen, then it can't take that sunlight and bounce it around all over the place like a maniac. And if we don't have that bouncing around, the light appears to come from only one spot. In this case, the sun. The same thing happens with all the other stars, too. That's why we can see Venus, Mercury, Saturn, Jupiter quite easily in this no atmosphere example. But as soon as we have our air again, we can't see them until it gets to be dark again because the sun's giving off light. Atmosphere bounces it around, makes it seem really bright everywhere and why we cannot see the nighttime sky during the day. That's why even when you go out into the space, you can see all that you want, even if the sun is up because there's no atmosphere in your way. At least a lot less, depending on how high up you went. <laughs> and we'll stop right about here. So this will be just right after sunset has happened. I'll turn the atmosphere back on just to be true to things. This is the atmosphere. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> and I'll keep the ground just because it can be a little bit hard to tell what's going on when I get rid of the ground. You're like, well, where in the world am I? <laughs> so we'll keep the ground. And one way to try and help to navigate around the nighttime sky is to keep in mind this one thing I'm going to show you here in a moment called the ecliptic, which is going to be a line in which our sun travels throughout the day. It's apparent path. So I'm going to go over here to markings. I'm going to turn on the ecliptic. So if we come back over here a little bit, we know that our sun just set over there in the west. That's what it does. Rises in the east and sets in the west. And since we are in the northern hemisphere, or uh, basically north of the Tropic of Cancer, Capricorn, a uh, tropic. Don't, ca don't quote me on that one. I haven't seen it for a while, so I'm sorry. <laughs> since we're northern, the sun will always appear a little bit south. 
no matter what time of the year. It's just that in the summer for us, it will become more right above our heads, but won't quite get all the way there for us in the majority, if not all, of the United States. And so we have this ecliptic line up. And you're going, why? Who cares? <laughs> why do I give any damn about the sun and its path in the nighttime sky? The sun did its thing during the day. It's nighttime. It should be about constellations and stars, not about the sun. Well, it's important because the path that the sun takes is actually how we get ourselves our zodiac constellations. So I'm going to turn on all of the constellation labels. Just so you kind of get an idea. There's a few out there. We got Pisces that's coming near the sunset area. Aries. Taurus the bull. And maybe you see them. Maybe you can already tell. Maybe you've practiced enough and you can kind of tell. And maybe you don't. And that's okay. I have the way. I have. I know the way to help you out. Turn on the lines. It might be for some examples here. Pisces. Supposed to be twin fish tied by the tail. Here's one fish. Two fish. Red fish. Blue fish. <laughs> tied together right here. And as they cross the ecliptic, that they are then considered zodiac. Aries, a little weird, of course, because A, that's supposed to be a ram, not to be confused with Aries, the god of war, that is spelled without the I. Aries, as the constellation here, has an I. And it also does not cross the ecliptic. Which is a little rough, a little weird. You're like, how is that considered a zodiac sign? Well, there was either a star at one point that was below the ecliptic here in which we could connect the whole constellation and has since died or in some way its light has been blocked to us or the ecliptic has changed a little bit more because of the path and tilt of the earth. Not that the sun is suddenly just like <laughs> bouncing around all over the place. Other constellations that are up include Taurus the Bull, Arija, or Ariga, either way, that's attached to Taurus, is not considered a zodiac despite them sharing the same star. Only Taurus is. Then we have Gemini the Twins right next to the moon, Cancer the Crab, Leo the Lion, and you would be able to see about eight of the zodiac, 12. 13 in total. I don't want to get into the whole 13 debate, whether there are 12 or 13 zodiac signs. Just know that there are about a dozen. <laughs> if you want to see all of them in one given night, you unfortunately cannot. You can see more. Like right now, we saw about six in the sky. You can see more of them if you let time go by. You wait until like two in the morning, you'll see some more. Like right now, it's getting to be about 10 o'clock on our simulation, and we get Virgo to show up. If you wish to see all of the constellations, though, you'll have to wait until a different part of the year because there's always going to be some constellations that are stuck on the daytime side, and they won't be on the night until it's a different part of the year. So let's say Pisces wasn't actually up at sunset. Maybe it was just below, just barely on the daytime side. If I want to see Pisces, then I just have to wait about two or three months, and then it will be in the sky. Which gets a little bit hard for some of us that are just getting into like the constellation game, and maybe you worry and care about astrology instead of astronomy. Astronomy is the science of the stars and everything around it in the nighttime sky, out in space. Astrology is finding patterns and seeing that it may or may not predict your future, your personality, and all that jazz. So if you care at all about astrology, I don't, but you might go out into the nighttime sky, you might go outside and be like, Where, where's, where's my constellation? I know that, let's say me, I was bored of Pisces. You might go outside and be like, well, where's Pisces? Where's Pisces? And right now it's 10 o'clock at night and Pisces isn't there. Even though we're looking over at the sunset side, time has passed. Pisces no longer there. And I'd be like, but I'm a Pisces and, uh, and my birthday's in March. It's almost March. Like, why don't I see Pisces? So the normal zodiac sign, if you will, which I guess would now be called your sun rising, maybe. I don't know what they get. They've been more complicated than I could remember. But your generic, what we're going to call it, your generic zodiac sign 
what happens is that on the day of your birth, the sun is actually in that constellation. Let's back up a good bit. Go right here. A little bit more. A little bit more. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, good. So today, people who are born today, they are going to be on the cusp of Capricorn and Aquarius because the sun happens to be in basically both of those constellations. If it was to be right over Aquarius, then you'd be in Aquarius, right over Pisces in a month. That's the same thing. So you can't actually see your own normal default zodiac sign at night or really at any time of the day, really. You have to wait about four or five months before you can see your own zodiac out in the nighttime sky. A little unfortunate, but that's how that be. So let's get rid of the that sun. We don't want that sun no more. We want the night. Now, no matter what constellations I talk about, you might not see what the hell we're talking about. A fish, a ram, cancer, the crab. That one thing did not look like a crab. So how do people see all these things? Well, you know, some people just have more imagination than others. But allow me to help you out a little bit. So we'll zoom out a bit just so we can see the nighttime sky almost fully. There we go. And I'll turn on some art, some constellation art. Some constellations that we can look at that you may or may not recognize would be this guy right over here, Ursa Major. That is the entire constellation in which part of it is the Big Dipper. Now, the Big Dipper, you can only see on the northern side. And you can always see it damn near every night here in the northern hemisphere. Now, if you're looking for the Dippers, you're looking for Ursa Major or Ursa Minor, the smaller version right over here. You might be looking out in the nighttime sky and going, is that the Big Dipper or is that the Small Dipper? Don't know. I need to find the other one so I can do a size comparison. I have a little trick. When in doubt, you found the Big Dipper. <laughs> That's as easy as the trick gets. Because the Little Dipper, I'll show you here in a moment. Let's get rid of the Constellation labels. Let's get rid of the art. And let's get rid of the lines. Okay, so we're looking in the nighttime sky. We're over in the north. Here's our little cardinal point in the north. We find this dipper-like shape right here. And I'm telling you, you're probably going to find the Big Dipper first. About 90% of the time plus. The only reason you would find the Little Dipper first is because you've been doing this for a while and you just know what to look for. Why? Because you'll see in a moment how faint the Little Dipper can be. And really is. So let's say you find the Big Dipper first. There's a nice trick in finding the little one. So you have the handle here that goes to the bucket, these four stars. You take the two stars furthest from the handle and go in a straight line until you hit the first brightest star. That guy right there, Polaris, the North Star, the very same North Star. Now why is that important? Well, so you know which way North is. Yes, but not quite for this scenario. It's so that you can have the start of the Little Dipper. North Star is the end of the handle for the little guy. So, Vildun is another star that's part of the Little Dipper. We got Circatorius, that's a star. I don't think Akfa Farg Farkadane. Wow, I've never seen that name before. That's fun. I've never known the names of these stars, so that's fun. I don't think Akfa Farkadane is actually one of the stars, but it might be. The other star, that's for a constellation, you can hardly see. Pretty much not gonna. So let's just zoom in a bit. So again, we had a little zoom too much. Here we go. So we got Polaris here. Yildun. Circatorius. Akfa Farkadane. That's a fun name. Yed Post, Furcad, and Kochab. You are about never going to ever, ever, never, ever find the Little Dipper first. Look at how much brighter the Big Dipper is than any part. <laughs> I 
my headset was just like, I'm turning off now. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> So in any case, you're going to find the Big Dipper way before you find the Little Dipper. Long story made short, short. So let's back up a little bit more. A little more. There we go. Turn back on our constellations. See all that we got. Some other ones that we can see would include Canis Minor and Orion here over in the more southern sky. You might recognize Orion, the hunter, by his three belt stars. Get rid of everything. Those three stars being Mintaka, Al Naheim, oh, Al Nalam, excuse me, and Al Al Natak. All very similar names. <laughs> and if you go right below the three belt stars, there's this kind of interesting fuzzy. Not the fuzzy I want. Whatever. <laughs> You're being mean to me. There we go. That's the fuzzy I wanted. This is actually the Orion Nebula, despite the software not wanting to tell you that's what it is. This big old blob here is actually a star nursery. Not like the plant store, but a place where stars are born. It's a very large cloud of dust and gas in which dozens, thousands, millions, billions of stars could be made over there. All right below Orion's three belt stars, which is kind of nice. Now, one thing to talk about with Orion 2 is that us, we people that may be watching that are in the western side of the world, will see Orion the Hunter. If I turn the art back on, that's the general idea that we see. We see his two shoulder stars, his belt stars, and then he's got some feet. And you'll either see like a bow on this side and a club, or in this case, he's got like an extra pelt and his club. But those on the more eastern side of the world will actually see Orion the drum. Whether they call it Orion or not, I couldn't say. Probably not. But they will see more of a drum. You can imagine, we have these two belt stars here, two stars here, that go down to the belt, make a nice little skinny trapezoid of sorts, and then open up wide again. You kind of get like a conga or bongo-like shape. You can imagine. So, it's all about what you'd like to see. You want a hunter? Fine. You want to jump? Fine. They're all stars anyway. And so there are 88 constellations in total. You can only see about 30, 40, 50 on any given night. There's always going to be some, again, that are stuck on the daytime side. And there's always going to be some that are stuck on the southern hemisphere. When I'm saying 88, that doesn't mean you get to see them on no matter where you are on this earth. There will be some that are always going to be stuck. Even if you're on the equator, halfway, you will still not be able to see all the constellations all the time because there'll be some stuck on the daytime side and something like Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, same thing, in which you have the North Star, might be pretty much out of view because it's going to be right on the, excuse me, right on the horizon. So if there's a building or any amount of hill in the way, you're not going to see those constellations. So if you want to see all 88, you gotta wait till a different part of the year, and you gotta do a little traveling to the other hemisphere. Whether it's going down to the south or coming up to the north, you gotta go to both hemispheres and experience multiple times of that year in order to see all 88. Now, are all 88 cool, fun, like mythical constellations where you have Taurus the bull that's actually Zeus transformed in order to protect the Pleiades from Orion because he's actually a little bit of a pervert? Or, yeah, no, not always. We have some, like over here, I can see right here. Sextons. It's just a sextant, a sixth of a circle, a measuring device, really. Why? Because there was probably about 50 or 60 of the more mythological constellations in the nighttime sky. And relatively recently, as in within hundreds of years instead of thousands of years ago. Some astronomer thought, you know, we need to pay homage to more technological advances in society. So we have things like the sextant. There is also a furnace somewhere in here. There's a broom. There's a bicycle pump. There's a bicycle pump. It's a real thing. So count as many constellations as you'd like. If you don't want the bicycle pump, 87 constellations. <laughs> Just like me. 
but we'll get those turned all the way off. Now we're going to do a little bit of a zooming out here, I think. We'll give ourselves a try. So let's get ourselves into a more flat-like position. We're going to get rid of the ground. We're going to go flying out into space. And we're actually going to go pay a visit to a couple of planets since we're here. Now, some of the ones that we were able to see during the nighttime sky was we saw that Jupiter was a possibility, Saturn, and Mercury was a possibility. So we'll go and visit those first. We will start off with Mercury. Let me find my... Oh, where's my finder tool? Search. Perfect. Let's go to Mercury. Click on there. A little turnaround. That was a fun little slide. Did we like that? Okay, stay centered on there. We're just going to go flying on it. We'll see how close we get. See how much of it we get to see. And zoom in, zoom in. Mercury, my least goddamn planet, least favorite planet in the world, in the universe <laughs> so far, in our solar system. I don't enjoy Mercury very much. Why? I'll talk about it in a moment. So Mercury here is kind of an interesting character in that his day is longer than his year. It means he rotates so slowly, like this, that he'll actually go all the way around the sun before he does it. He has temperatures that range around the 600 degrees Fahrenheit, 700 degrees Fahrenheit on the daytime side, all the way down to like minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit on the nighttime side. Because Mercury is one of those planets that just doesn't really have an atmosphere that you can talk about. So on the daytime side, A, it's very, very close to the sun. So it's just getting smacked and bombarded by this energy all the time on the daytime side. The nighttime side, however, is not exposed to that and doesn't have an atmosphere to keep in that heat. Because although, yes, atmosphere likes to do that whole colorful scatter around thing, it also does the same thing in a way for heat. That is how we have our greenhouse effect, is that visible light comes in to, through our atmosphere and hits the planet, let's say Mercury in this case. It heats up the rocks, it heats up the rocks, it heats up the rocks. The rocks have all this energy, they want to get rid of it. So they start to emit infrared light or heat. Same thing. If there was atmosphere in the way, that air could take that heat and bring it back down. It could smack it down to the ground again, keep it in the air a little bit by bouncing it around, or in some way slow down that heat escaping out into space. Without that heat blanket, you don't keep your heat. Doesn't matter how hot you got during the day, nighttime side, the rocks just get rid of it completely. So that's how you get huge changes in temperature between the daytime and the nighttime side of Mercury. And the reason why I don't really like Mercury all the way is because it's kind of unfortunate that we get to call it a planet. <laughs> because the reason that we have our, or the way that we have our delineations for planets is that A, it needs to be large enough that its gravity is strong enough that it can turn itself into a sphere. In this case, Mercury does that fine. Lots of bodies do. There's even a few giant, giant asteroids that are very spherical and could be planets on just that point alone. Another one is that you must be revolving around a star. In this case, Mercury goes around the sun. Easy enough. Everything in our solar system is going around the sun. So it doesn't knock out too many bodies as possibilities. That's more getting rid of like wandering or traveling rocks, gases, stuff like that. The third one is the tricky one in which you must have a clean neighborhood in which you don't have a bunch of debris, a bunch of asteroids and stuff around you. You can still have moons, obviously, because it could be somewhat debated that Jupiter has a very messy neighborhood with having 70-odd-plus moons around them. But the reasoning behind that is because you need to be either in a position to where something else around you can clean your neighborhood, or you're large enough in which your gravity is either going to kick off all that stuff or bring it into itself and slam it down and basically make the planet a little bit bigger. Why is that necessary? I couldn't tell you for sure. But Mercury in this case gets to be considered a planet because the sun is so close by. Any material, any like little bits of rock, let's say, that get relatively close to the sun, either fall in, burn up, 
or if they hit just the right track, get whipped out, get slingshotted right out of there, keeping Mercury clean. Now, Pluto is no longer considered a planet because of that third rule and keeping a clean neighborhood, at which if we're lucky, we'll go and try and visit him too. The funny part about the planet delineation thing, though, is that none of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, nor Mars, would be considered planets if it wasn't for their positioning, because none of them are large enough to keep a clean neighborhood on their own. They are all close enough to either the Sun, the Jupiter, the Jupiter, <laughs> Sun, or Jupiter, or a mixture of both, to where their neighborhoods are cleaned by those two large bodies. They don't do it themselves, but hey, that's how it is. So to me, Mercury is not considered a planet because I have more of a ruling, just kind of more for myself. It's obviously not official because nobody wants my rule for some reason. <laughs> I don't blame them in a way. Is that to me, a planet is something that has activity. Atmospheric, seismic, some kind of activity, whether it's weather or it's got some kind of crustal moving around then it can be considered a planet, in my opinion. Let me see. With enough time between cubes, you can shove a theoretical infinite amount of ice cubes. <laughs> With enough time. Yeah, I think you, you probably could. Yeah, you'd be fine. <laughs> Just be patient and let them in. And speaking of ice, actually, Mercury, despite being so close to the sun, actually does have ice on it. It'll actually be at its poles. I don't know why I'm reaching up like I can touch it. <laughs> but at its north and south poles, because it is spinning on that pole, which means that those parts will never get pointed towards the sun, they are always in the dark. So there are very, very small amounts of ices, including freshwater ice. A lot of it can be CO2 ice, though. So don't just get all excited and think we can go mine that and be like, hey, we got more water for Earth. Great. It's not enough to be worth talking about. Mercury is very small, only about 2,000 kilometers across. And so having just a little bit of ice on that is. Go move on. Do something else. Another, not you, another planet we'll go talk about that's in the nighttime sky is Venus, which we obviously need to back up. We can't see her. There she is. Get back in there. Okay, Venus, hello, how are you? Very simple looking planet in a way, kind of like Mercury. Mercury was just like a burnt rock, like just burnt coal, like just so much gray from all the sun exposure. How much to it? Venus has a nice soft yellowing to it. What makes Venus probably the most unique thing about it is that it is the hottest planet in our solar system. And it seems weird because Mercury is a good deal closer. I mean, he is the first planet, yet Venus, being further away, somehow is the hottest. Mercury gets up to, let's say, 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Venus gets to and pretty much stays at 900 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. Why? Because she has a thick, super thick atmosphere, like thickety. Put some butter and syrup on that because it's thick atmosphere. It's got all kinds of sulfur, CO2, all kinds of agents to where what we're looking at right now, it is just clouds. It is just the atmosphere. You are not seeing the ground at all. So as we mentioned before, the atmosphere is a very good heat blanket. It keeps in heat. So any energy from the sun that is able to penetrate through the clouds and heat up the planet, it gets pretty much trapped in there by this super thick cloud all around the planet. So even on the nighttime side, the rocks are going to sit here and they got all this energy and they're trying to like eh, eh, get rid of all this heat. But all those clouds keep it all in. And so they never cool down, keeping the overall temperature of the planet pretty consistent at about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like twice the temperature of your broiler in your house. Like go turn on the broiler and like put your hand kind of near it. Don't put it in there, obviously, but like nearby, like open the door and, it'll, and feel that heat and then double it. Welcome to Venus. That's what makes it a little bit tricky on trying to visit Venus. Visit Venus is that we have had several satellites go to Venus and try to land on it, and some have been successful, but they don't last very long before the machinery and more importantly the software and all those little nice copper bits just melt. They get to be crisped and dead. So don't want to stay there too long. 
And we got some time still. We will go look at another planet. So Earth would be next. I'm not going to go look at Earth because that's boring. <laughs> but I do wonder how the software shows Earth. See how it does. <laughs> it just doesn't. It freaks out. It's like, mm, mm. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so then we'll go to the next one. Mars. Take me to Mars, baby. Okay. So another thing to show with Mars is that there's a couple of extra labels next to him. They're a little bit hard to see. That's a little bit hard for me to dance around him. But, hey, hey, come back. Come here, boy. So besides Earth, Mars is the first planet in our order from closest to the sun furthest out that has any moons. Mercury, no moons. Venus, no moons. Earth has a moon made of cheese, supposedly. Other conspiracy theories we're not getting into. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Fear and panic, which would be their translations, which is fitting, seeing as Mars is the Roman god of war. All of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all Roman names, but they are still of basically the same thing in Greek mythology. So Venus being Aphrodite, Mercury being Apollo, Earth being Gaia, Mars being Aries, Jupiter being Zeus, Saturn being Kronos, Zeus's father, Uranus being Uranus, Uranus, same thing, pretty much father of Kronos, grandfather to Zeus, Neptune, Poseidon, Pluto, Hades, all that jazz. So Mars here being the red planet because of all of the rust, the iron oxide that it has in its soil. So iron oxide, rust, how do you get rust? You need metal, you need water. <gasps> There's water on Mars. Oh my God, let's go get it. There was there's still a little bit of ices on Mars, but they're mostly dry ices, meaning CO2, not liquid water, not drinkable, not good. <laughs> so we're not quite sure all the way how, when, all the way, and where it went. But there used to be water on Mars. There are several notions that show that there definitely was. There are remnants of rivers and lakes that have now dried up. There's rust everywhere. And there are trace amounts of some fresh ices at the poles. Where have they gone? Uh, sad. Now, Venus is about the same size of Earth. It's a tiny bit smaller. Mars is a decent consideration smaller. He's probably about 40 to 60% the size of Earth in that area. So you might be thinking, well, that sounds kind of weird. Why is it so much smaller? And we consider that to be like the planet that we want to go live on next. Because nobody wants to go live on Venus when it's 900 freaking degrees. Even people that live in Arizona would be like, well, that's a little warm. I don't think I want that. <laughs> so Mars is in an okay spot as far as being in the Goldilocks habitable zone. I, the, the habitable, habitable zone is a little bit, of a rough conversation to have because it's very complex. They just have one blanket zone. It doesn't quite work out that way. Like Earth, for example, isn't really in the Goldilocks zone if it didn't have its magnetic field. It's able to bounce off a lot of that polarizing energy that the sun tries to give us. And if we didn't have that, we'd have a little too much energy and we'd be cooked a bit. Like enough to where life may not have started in the way back when, if we didn't have the magnetic field. Mars is a little bit on the outside. Like, it's on the verge a little bit out to where it's a little bit cold. You can still have liquid water, but it doesn't last very long. Part of it's because there's not a strong atmosphere, not a thick one, to where it can keep in and pressurize that liquid in that state. If you don't have enough pressure, that liquid is just going to turn itself right into a gas. It doesn't quite matter what temperature it is, depending on the conditions. So you could take like a bottle of water with you, open it up on Mars, and it would just start to fizzle out. There's not enough pressure keeping that liquid as a liquid, so it turns into steam, despite it being super cold. <laughs> Bye, Mars.
And we'll be taking time in other planetarium shows to talk more about each of the planets, but just to give you a general idea of what they all look like and what's their bread and butter. Speaking of bread and butter, we'll go say hi to Jupiter, the one who has definitely eaten too much bread and butter because he's a big boy. I mean, our camera just got slammed into him. <laughs> so here is Jupiter. Jupiter has a bunch of moons. But four are worth talking about. There you go. In order to remember the four names, there's a fun little acronym. Is it an acronym? I'll say what it is and you'll tell me if it's an acronym or not. I eat green cats. You remember I eat green cats because I is Io. Green is Ganymede. I eat green cats. Oh, it's not even an order. That's weird. Io, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto. Oh, no, that is an order. It just looks kind of... It, the ordering makes it seem deceiving that Ganymede's closer, but Europa is second. In any case, Jupiter being the largest planet that we have in our solar system and has 60, 70 plus moons surrounding it because it has a very large amount of gravity, it is big enough to where A... It technically doesn't even revolve around the sun. It technically revolves around a point in which the sun and Jupiter kind of share because Jupiter is large enough to even make the sun have to revolve a little bit. It's a little bit of a dance. And Jupiter was pretty close, relatively speaking, to being its own star. Jupiter being a giant can also be considered a brown dwarf or stillborn star. If you just have more mass, not necessarily being bigger, add more mass, had more stuff to it, it'd be able to have enough gravity to where it could squish down its hydrogen atoms down to where it would release energy, give off light, and be a star. However, he didn't quite make that mark, so we just get this big old planet instead. Jupiter right now doesn't show it, but it has that really big red cloud that you've probably seen up before that's the great red dot of jupiter which is basically a very dry hurricane all of the parts of a hurricane you could think of just without water huge amounts of wind and turbulence and nuts and it's been going around for like hundreds of years even um what's his name i'm spacing it now galileo thank you the astronomer who had first seen a the first four moons of jupiter Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa could see the great red spot back then. And that was in the early 1600s. So this storm has been going for 400 years plus. And will probably still continue to go on for a good while longer, but it is dying down. It is getting a little bit weaker. So it might be on the way down. It might kick up again. We'll see. And one last planet to talk about for today will be Saturn. The reason why I'm going to be starting, stopping at Saturn is because you cannot see any of the other planets in the nighttime sky with the naked eye. You can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, sure, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in the nighttime sky with just the naked eye. Don't need any binoculars. Don't need any telescopes. You can see them well enough to that which we've known about these planets for a long, long time, thousands of years. We didn't know Uranus, the next planet, until the 1740s, I want to say. No, 1840s. That's pretty recent consider for all of space consideration. 1840s. That ain't a long time. So Saturn here, it's big deal, is having these rings. The rings, despite being wide enough to stretch between the Earth and the moon, which is multiple millions of miles. They're only about 30 feet thick. 30 feet thick. They are super skinny. Super thin. So you could essentially fit the rings of Saturn inside a lot of buildings, <laughs> thickness-wise. The reason why they're so thin is you can imagine that any material that tries to stray out, either high or low, it's going to get bombarded by all the other material that's there. So let's say I got this one rock, my mouse being up here on the top, it's going to be a rock, he's going to fly on in, 
there are just uncountable amounts of pieces of rock and ice in these rings, ranging from grains of dust to like school buses all over the place. So my rock comes flying on in, starts whacking some of the rocks. It's knocked around a little bit, but still has some momentum and goes past it. Oh, but we got some gravity that brings the rock back in. Goes through some turbulence. Doesn't get as far away with this time. Gravity brings it back, smacks it around. Blah, 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 blah. It does this whole thing until it is level with everybody else. You stay with us or you get smacked. Basically is how it turns into. Any material that tries to stray too far out hits too much material and stays right with everybody else, making this nice, relatively thin 30 feet compared to the whole size of Saturn. <laughs> That's nothing. So it's pretty nice and clean. The reason why there are these gaps in Saturn's rings is because there's actually two moons, one in this larger gap, one in the smaller one, and the moons are just cleaning up that area. Any dust, ice, rock that gets close to the moon either just falls right onto the planet, excuse me, right onto the moon, or gets winged right off because of the gravity. Like if it just barely misses the planet, and it shoof, gets shot right off, keeping that area nice and clean. One last thing to talk about with Saturn is that it is very much not dense, how it's made up with a good deal of nitrogen and hydrogen, much like Jupiter, much like the sun, being mostly hydrogen, some hydrogen, helium, thank you, that's the word, plus some helium. And so you've probably heard that with Saturn that you could put it in a bathtub if you had one that big. And it would float. And that is 100% true. Despite how big it is and how much mass that it has, it is a low enough density to where water is more dense in which Saturn can then float upon it because the amount of water it displaces is heavier than Saturn itself. And that's how buoyancy kind of works without going too in-depth with it. And so with that, we're just going to end things right there. That's going to be our planetarium show for today. Wasn't too long, but keeping it nice and short, one little little one-hour breaks, one-hour chunks of time. We got to see what's going on in the nighttime sky a bit, figure out what's the deal with the blue sky, with the colorful yellowish-orange sky, some constellations that are out there, and even some of the planets that are there. So thank you very much for coming to see the show. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll probably be doing it again next Sunday too, same time. Yeah, we'll see what we'll be talking about then. I'm thinking we're going to be doing like a star comparison kind of thing. We're going to go look at up all kinds of different stars, talk about the different sizes, temperatures, colors, stuff like that. Make a big old comparison chart to see what's the brightest, largest, all that jazz. So the next time I see you is when I will. Have a good one until then. Bye-bye for now.